All right, everybody, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And really, welcome to our first video in our new series covering arterial blood gases. And in this first lesson, we're going to take it back to the basics, making sure that we're all on the same page, and we're going to start off in discussing our respiratory system anatomy. And for those of you that don't know, my name is Eddie Watson, and I am going to be presenting this series of lessons for you. And as always, in order to stay up to date on our latest lessons as they become available, make sure and subscribe to our channel below, and make sure you hit that bell icon in order to be notified when those new lessons become available. All right, and so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and begin our lesson. And like I said, we're going to be talking about the respiratory system anatomy. And as you know, being in the ICU, one of the primary responsibilities that we have for our patients is to really help and manage their their airway and oftentimes their, their ventilation. And one of the most important tools that we have in order to really see how our patients are doing is to check their oxygenation status via uh, arterial blood gas or an ABG. And so with that in mind, to really understand the respiratory system anatomy will really go a long way in just giving you a complete picture of what's going on with your patient and ultimately leading to some alterations that you might find in your blood gas. And so to start us off, I do have a picture here as I often do in order to help us talk through some of this anatomy and what's going on. But understand with all this that we talk about, the main job of our lungs and this respiratory system is ultimately the gas exchange. So we want to pull that oxygen out of the air as well as releasing the CO2. And if you remember, our oxygen is fuel when we combine it with glucose. Remember, think the electron transport chain for our body's metabolism. And one of the waste products or the byproduct of that metabolism is CO2. And so we need a way to be able to get rid of that afterwards. And that is essentially the whole purpose of our respiratory system. So we're going to go through here and talk through the different parts of the respiratory system anatomy. A lot of this is probably going to be review for you guys, but it doesn't hurt to make sure that we're all on the same page. And really, our goal here is going to be to follow the flow of air through this system, as well as talk about some of the components and how they work and how that works towards the main goal of that gas exchange. So to start out, when, when we inhale, there's a couple different ways in which the air can come in. We can bring air in through our nose, or we can bring air in through our mouth. And these first couple pathways that the air can take are going to be the first ones that we list out. So going up through the nose, we have what we call the nasopharynx, or in the mouth, we call it the oropharynx. And initially, this air coming in is in two distinct passageways, but they do eventually meet up here in the back of the throat. And this is an area that we call the laryngopharynx. And when we take these three passageways together, these are what form what we call just the pharynx. And the laryngopharynx continues all the way down through here. And this is actually where we have a common pathway for both air and food. Now the food will continue down into the esophagus and will be prevented from going down into the rest of the respiratory system by the epiglottis. But from the laryngopharynx, the air will work its way down into the next area, and this is going to be our larynx. And this is also where you're going to find your voice box, and this is that first true distinction of a separate pathway for the air, separate from where our food will also go. Now at the point where the, the larynx ends, this actually ends the first imaginary area of division that we have, and this is something that we call the upper airway. And so from here, the air is going to continue on down, and it's going to enter into the first section of what we call the lower airway. And this first part of the lower airway is what we call the trachea. And as you can see with the trachea, you have those cartilage rings, which are really there to support and hold that airway open. Now, as the air comes down, this is where we're going to run into the first of actually many branches in the lower airway. And this is where we're going to branch off into our two main stem bronchi. Over here we have our right main stem, and over here we have our left main stem. And the place where these split is actually an important place to know, especially when you're looking at, let's say, an x-ray. 
It's going to be this spot right here, which is what we refer to as the carina. And after these bronchi split from the trachea, this is actually where they enter into the lung itself. And it enters through an area that we call the hilum. And this is a, another very important area because this is also the entry and exit point for the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. And it's also important to know when you look at these lungs that they're not the same size and shape. If we look over here at our right lung, you actually see that you, you have three different lobes, which we call the upper, middle, and lower lobes. But if you look at our, our left lung, you'll see we only have two, our upper and our lower. But in addition to that, you'll also notice this notch down here on the, the lower portion of the inside of the left lung. And this notch is what we, we actually call the cardiac notch because that's actually where we have the heart, which is poking out right here. Now, before we continue down the, the respiratory system pathway, I do want to take a slight divergence, and I want to talk about some of the, the muscles that we use to aid in respiration. The first of these is going to be the diaphragm. And this one here we can find down at the very bottom of our lungs and heart, which essentially form the, the floor for those organs. And what happens with the diaphragm is when it contracts, it actually causes the diaphragm to lower. In addition to that, you do also have accessory muscles along the thoracic cavity. And what happens when these muscles expand is they cause that cavity to open up and it expands open. And so when combined with this expanding thoracic cavity from the accessory muscles and from the diaphragm lowering, that this allows the lungs to expand and create that negative pressure which sucks that air in. Then at the end of inspiration when those muscles relax that diaphragm comes back up and that thoracic cavity closes back down the lungs will go back to their their normal size and shape and it's this higher pressure that's in the lungs as well as this collapsing cavity size that caused the air to escape back out the respiratory tract in the reverse process that we're going to talk through here, leading to our exhalation. And so where we left off in the lower airway, we had just divided into the left and right main stem bronchi, and they've entered through the hilum into the lungs. And that initial split was actually the first of three main splits that we're going to see with the bronchi. We have that first split, which is what we call our primary bronchi. But then the next split from there is going to be what we call the low bar or the secondary bronchi. And this number is actually going to be different depending which lung you're in. If you remember, we have three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. And so it really goes without saying that you're going to have three different low bar bronchi on the right lung and two different low bar bronchi for the left lung. And from there, things are going to split down even further into what we call our segmental or our tertiary bronchi. And these basically go to define segments of the lung that are really kind of contained units within themselves. And so as we kind of begin to talk about some of this, this splitting, if you really think about this, this whole system is kind of like an upside down tree. And it's kind of where we get the name, the bronchial tree comes from that concept. But in much the same way, you have a, a tree with a trunk, and it goes up and it begins to branch and branch. And as we go on, these just continue to branch off into smaller and smaller segments. That's exactly what's going on inside of our lungs. And so as these, these bronchi continue to, to split and branch, they're going to get narrower and narrower. And after those segmental bronchi, they become much narrower, and we refer to them as bronchioles, which really means little bronchi. And this process continues to go with narrowing and splitting and narrowing and splitting within the bronchioles, anywhere from 15 to 20 generations of these splits. And so if you just kind of imagine, these just continue to split, continue to split, and I can't even make the drawing so small. And so I'm actually going to open this up in order to be able to show you better here. 
But as we continue splitting, we're going to come down to what we refer to as a terminal bronchial. And this is one of the last sections of bronchial that we have. From there, that's going to split off into the final segment, which is what we refer to as the respiratory bronchioles. And it's at this point that we begin to see some pouchings appear. And these pouches are, are what we actually call alveoli coming together and forming these alveolar sacs. And it's really mind-boggling when you think about it that inside of our lungs, when we look at all of those alveoli, that we have somewhere between 300 and 500 million of these little alveoli. And so really, like we had talked about, the air is coming down and working its way in. And this is really the final destination for that air that we breathe in. And one thing to note is with all of these branching and segmentation of these bronchioles, we actually have our, our blood vessels that continue to follow along with this. And these blood vessels will actually work their way and line the outside of these individual alveoli with capillary beds and are what permit that gas exchange to take place. And so we have coming in that deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle that has come through the pulmonary arteries and has branched down and has come out to the alveoli. They go through those capillaries, come back out into what we refer to as the pulmonary vein, making their way back to the left heart, now oxygenated, in order to be pumped throughout the rest of the body. And so finally here, I do want to break this down just a little bit more and make this a little bit easier for you to see what is happening. And so what I've drawn out here is we actually have the alveolar wall. And these are those cells that make up the wall of the alveolus. And on the outside of that, we have the endothelial cells that make up the capillary wall. And inside the alveoli, we do have that surfactant, which is that liquid layer that lines the inside of the alveoli. And then on the outside of both the alveolar wall and the capillary wall, we have a membrane that we call the basement membrane. And in between those basement membranes, we have a whole bunch of proteins that are really here to help hold the structure together and this is that connective tissue and so if we think about we've got our air that is coming in here and we have our our oxygen that's coming in as this oxygen works its way and diffuses its way across all of these barriers entering into the bloodstream within the capillary bed and it's at this point here that we have a red blood cell with our hemoglobin molecule and the oxygen will bind itself right onto that hemoglobin. And that red blood cell is whisked away to go to the rest of the body in order to oxygenate the tissues. All right, so that about sums up the extent of what we're going to cover in this discussion of our respiratory system anatomy. Again, I hope this was a good review for you to see all these different parts and everything that's happening leading to that ultimate end goal of gas exchange. All right, and so with that said, I do want to thank you for watching this lesson. I really hope that you guys found this useful. If you did find it helpful, make sure and hit that like button below because it really does help to spread the word about our channel. As well as in the comments below, tell us what your favorite part of this video was or feel free to ask any questions that you might have. And if you like this information that we have to provide, we really invite you to subscribe to our channel here. From here, make sure and watch the next lesson in this series, which we're going to be taking a good look at blood gases, how they work, and really what's happening with that gas exchange. Or also feel free to check out another one of our great series of lessons on hemodynamics. As always, thank you for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next lesson.